Praise be Jesus Christ, and thank you for joining me for Lexio on the Go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our scripture readings are taken from Ephesians 4, 23 through 28, and the Gospel of Matthew 22, verses 1 through 14. These are the readings for the 19th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, I first want to go into Ephesians because most of the time we'll be taking with Matthew. So in Ephesians, St. Paul says that through baptism, we have become a new creation. This is so important. Um, it is important uh, to be baptized. Um, so it is through baptism that we become a new creation. When we were born um, from our mother, we became a part of creation, right? We were conceived in her womb. I guess technically we become part of creation at that point. But then we are born, of course, into creation. Um, when we are baptized, we become a new creation. Uh, we are what we call regenerated, right? So we're born into this spiritual life, eternal life now within our soul. And so St. Paul says we are recreated in justice and truth. Justice and truth. Justice means to now be right with God. Um, so we are made right with God. We are made holy in God. We are righteous um, and in truth. So now we live according to a, a certain truth, of course, that's been revealed to us by God. Jesus says that he is the truth. And so we are baptized into Christ, meaning we are baptized into truth. And then we are recreated in that truth, made right with God. And then we live according to that truth. So you could say the rest, the remainder of our life after being recreated, the rest of our life, you can kind of, we could judge ourselves, of course, and we will be judged on um, according to we are right with God. Okay, we were made right with God and we were baptized into truth. So we could say, um, am I right with God still? In other words, have I committed a, an offense against him that has separated myself from him? And um, how far am I from the truth? Um, do I live what I profess? Do I live the truths that I profess? Um, not that I profess, but that the church professes and I agree with, um, and, and, and so on and so forth. So, all right, with that being said, what does it look like then? What, what are some of the ways that we should uh, live? And um, the gospel really goes into this. The gospel is, is this is a great gospel because it talks about um, the, the fact that Jesus Christ has come. Uh, he came for all people, Jewish and Gentile, right? There's only kind of two categories at the time of Christ. There is the Jew and there is the Gentile. Um, the first part of the wedding feast talks about a king who threw a feast for his son. All right, so this would be God the Father and God the Son. And he goes out and he invites people. There's some excuses that people make, uh, particularly one excuse is, well, I can't go because I need to go to my farm. Um, I can't go because I need to go do my business. And then the others um, actually attack the, uh, the servants that have come out to make the request. So the king sends servants out and he says, come to my wedding banquet, banquet, everything is ready for you. Some say, I have to go to my farm. Some say I have to go to my business. Some attack the servants and I believe even kill the servants. So this is really the response of the Jewish people. This part of the parable is really talking about how Jesus' own people, the Jewish people, his own brothers did not receive him. When the message was sent by the prophets and then uh, for, when, the, when the message was sent by John the Baptist, the last and greatest prophet, and then when the word came flesh himself, um, some of them said, no, I have other things to do, farm, business, merchandise, and then some went so far as to mock, to mistreat, and to even kill servants. Remember, John the Baptist was killed, and then even Jesus Christ, of course, was uh, betrayed and crucified. All right, then we get to the kind of the second part of the parable, which is talking about the people that actually come into the feast. That would be the Christians. So the Christians that actually are anyone, at that matter, any anybody that had a Jew or Gentile that had accepted the invitation. So if you were a Jew and you did accept the invitation, or you were a pagan and you accept the invitation, then you are now in the hall. Okay, what does that hall represent? Well, that hall represents the church. So now you have people that are in the church. This is clearly now speaking to the Christian. So we find one of those people, a Christian, that has um, that is not, he does not have a wedding garment. Now, in those days, the king would have provided the right attire for the place. 
So this is a person that either um, w was given the wedding garment but did not take advantage of it, or maybe perhaps he took advantage of it and then threw it off, okay? So this is someone that is not taking, uh, has not um, kept sanctifying grace, has lost that sanctifying grace within their soul given to them by baptism. So I would say particularly this is someone that has committed a serious offense against God um, post-baptism, after baptism, and has not reconciled. Um, maybe they prefer their own garments, you know? So this person in this, in this um, parable is obviously wearing his own garments, and he is not wearing the garment that the king is providing. What, what does this say to me? Well, this says to me, Matt, God has given you grace. He has given you sanctifying grace through baptism, through the sacraments, through the Eucharist, through reconciliation, through marriage, all of these wonderful sacraments that he has given you. These are the garments. Why do you prefer your own garments? Now you could take this many different ways. You could say, okay, God is offering you baptismal grace. Oh, I'm a good person. In other words, I have my own garments. I don't need that. Marriage in the church. Oh, well, I got married in the state of Texas, and, and I know I love her, and she loves me, da 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 We got that covered. I don't need your sacramental um, church marriage thing. Um, what about confession? Oh, well, I got right with God. I, I just prayed to him. You know, I went on a walk the other day, and I prayed to God. Um, okay, so I got that taken. In other words, all of these exceptions are really our own clothes. All of these exceptions are our own clothes. When God has a wardrobe, full of seven amazing garments. You could think of these as the seven sacraments, right? And he wants to just uh, lavish these on us. So this, this, this is a great parable, Matthew 22, one through 14. It's a great parable for everyone, Jew and Gentile alike, but it really hits home to the Christian that is um, perhaps um, not, not taking advantage of all the garments that God wants to give through sacramental grace and instead relying on one's own um, skills, one's own talent, uh, resources to provide for themselves. Now, this reminds me of all the way back in Genesis, when what happened after Adam and Eve sinned? What did they do? They clothed themselves. They found themselves naked. In other words, they were, uh, something was missing, something was not right. They knew that, they hid from God. But then notice they clothe themselves. They know that they need something. They provide themselves with these fig leaves, which is not gonna do the job. God then says what? He provides them uh, skin, animal skin. That meant something had to be sacrificed for them to be clothed. This is, in a sense, we think the first sacrifice in scripture, is at least that's the first indication of a sacrifice. Something was sacrificed so that they could be clothed by God and be taken care of. Adam and Eve clothed themselves, that doesn't work. God clothes them, they receive those garments from God. We also can take this to mind. We should not clothe ourselves. Let us not depend on our own brilliance, our own education, our own talents. Let us depend, of course, on God and let God clothe us. He wants to clothe everyone. Everyone can be clothed. We just need to be open to that and want that. One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the first gift of the Holy Spirit is the fear of the Lord, that we humble ourselves and we say, you are God, I am not. I can't clothe myself. Please clothe me, Lord. Clothe me, Lord. Um, so that's definitely a big piece of this. I also want to point out just a practical matter, and this is particularly, I want to particularly focus this to young men. Um, young men are, you know, a, a part of uh, being a man is built into us to provide and protect. We want to, especially as, as we uh, go through puberty and we become uh, from a boy to a man. We understand that there's something in us that wants to provide and protect. Now this can take on many different forms, but it even starts to form in a young man that wants to take this seriously. Um, you even think of sports. I played a lot of sports uh, when I was younger, and there's this sense even within a sport to provide for your teammates and protect your teammates. Um, you start to realize this about your family as you get older, that you take on more chores and you want to stick up for your family, maybe stick up for your, your siblings, for instance, to provide and protect. Um, then as of course, as we get older and God calls us, God could call us into the priesthood and that would be to provide and protect, uh, particularly let's say in a parish, to provide the sacraments to your parishioners and to protect 
from the heresies that are out there. Protect from a lack of charity. Protect from the dangers of sin, the devil and the flesh, and all of that. So there's a sense, uh, uh, then of course, of a lay person that's going to become a, a married man, uh, the sense to provide and protect for this lady, this beautiful woman. Uh, my son Polycarp says that marriage is very simple. He, I think when he was four or five, he said this. Marriage is finding the pretty woman and getting her. Finding the pretty girl and getting her. Well, what about, what about that pretty girl? You want to provide and protect for her. And, and showing that you can provide and protect, in a sense, uh, is, enables you to get her. And so, um, this providing and protecting is important. So, particularly speaking to young men here, I want to t mention a few things uh, about this parable. The number one thing that we provide and protect for is our soul. That's first and foremost, the one thing necessary to provide for our soul. How do we provide for our soul? Daily prayer, weekly mass, regular confession, take advantage of all the sacraments, those garments that you can put on. So provide, uh, take, take the provisions that have been given for your soul and then protect your soul from the devil, the flesh and the world. We know the number one thing that probably attacks us is purity. And so idolatry and purity. So number one sins that I kind of see are people not going to mass and people entering into the sexual act outside of marriage. Um, so we take the provisions that God has given us to our soul, take that garment, wear that garment, and then protect that garment. Protect the grace in your soul, um, primarily by daily prayer, weekly mass, regular confession. Those are key. So that's that first thing. That's that nuptial robe keep that on the baptismal grace and all the other graces that have been given to us and then i think after that and that's first and foremost and what's so beautiful about that is you know mother Teresa, you know really said are we called to be successful or are we called to be faithful she said we're not called to be successful we're called to be faithful and if we are faithful then we have not failed if we are faithful then we have succeeded already in other words, if, if I have gone my whole life and I may not make a lot of money, I may not have a lot of friends, I people around me may think I'm a loser, but if I have provided for my soul, taken the provisions I need for my soul, and protected my soul from the devil, the flesh, and the world, then I have succeeded, right? In a sense, I've lost everything in the world, but I've gained everything in eternity, right? Um, Jesus has said, you can you can gain the whole world but lose your soul. What it, also, you can lose the world. You can lose all the all the accolades that are out there, but then gain your soul. All right. So that's first and foremost. And then second, after that's taken care of, what is the best option? What is the best option, especially for a young man? Personal opinion here, but I think the very first thing a young man should ask is, am I called to the monastic life? The monastic life is the closest you can kind of get to heaven because you're actually called to live out heaven here on earth. You basically are living out heaven, um, this, this constancy. And I'm talking about a, a cloistered monk here. Uh, it's a very beautiful vocation if someone is called to it. But we have to say, am I called to the monastic life? Let's say I'm not called to the monastic life. Well, then the second question a young man should ask is, am I called to the priesthood? Because if monastic life is living the heavenly life here on earth, and the married life is living the earthly life now so that we can get to heaven. Priesthood is that middle ground. Priesthood is actually someone living here on earth, but helping people get to heaven. And it's someone living here on earth that is bringing heavenly things to those here on earth. So the priesthood is a beautiful, it's a pontifex, it's a bridge builder between heaven and earth and earth and heaven. And it's that ladder that we need. They are another Christ, an altar Christus. So what a beautiful honor if a young man is called to that. But what if a, a young man is not called to be a monk, not called to be a priest? Well, then I would say they're going to be called, of course, to be married. And this should be, you know, obviously what, what someone is looking for is, okay, then that I'm going to be married. And, and how do I find this lady? And how do I provide and protect for her? Um, given that I've already taken taken care of myself and the, the needs of my soul primarily. Now I want to provide and protect for this lady. Well, I think there are three options. And I think they come from this parable in a sense of what is seen in this parable is that some people are interested in their farm. Some people are interested in their merchandise. And some people are interested in either uh, some type of combat, either attacking or defending. Um, and I do think that uh, this is obviously a parable that Jesus is talking about, but it has to do with human nature. 
And these are the needs that we have in our society. We need people to do agriculture. We need people to farm. We need people to go into the trades. We need people that will uh, be helping us with, with all these basic things, carpentry, um, agriculture, air conditioning, plumbing, all of these things are, are tangible things that we all need for daily life. That's number one. I'm gonna put that in the farm category. And then you have the merchandise. These would be the people that buy and sell. And there's so much that has to do with this, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're doing a small business, um, all of these different things um, that are very helpful. And then you have the military. These would be, in, in this case, we have the servants that are attacked, but then we also have the people that go out and protect. And so in this, in this, um, I'm going to, I just put it in the, in the description here, the military, but you could also put first responders, you could put our firefighters, our police officers. So I would say to a young man, um, if you're not called to monastic life and you're not called to priesthood, then take very seriously and early on then the call to holy matrimony, a beautiful sacrament in which you can clothe yourself with the sacramental grace, um, and, and do this along with another person for life. Um, bonded with them and in that category you're going to have to provide and protect not only for your wife but also for your kids and so discern what what am I good at um, will I be better at farming or a trade will I be better uh, in the merchandise in the business world some type of buying and selling um, will I be better in the military will I be better uh, firefighter police officer serving people in that capacity and I think that's that's a good way to go practically speaking you know if you're wondering what should I do you can go into the trades trade school or directly into the trades you could go to college um, so that you could learn how to move into one of those merchandise area categories or of course you could sign up for the military be trained go into the military and do your service uh, for your country. Um, so I hope this kind of helps um, put everything in perspective. Of course, first and foremost is getting that garment, uh, which most of us were given at infancy, but keeping that garment um, so that we can um, enjoy that wedding banquet now and for all eternity. Thank you for joining me for this Lexio on the go. Please take the time to visit linktoliturgy.com where you'll find fast, free, and faithful resources on the gospel. And also check out our online school, linktoliturgy.teachable.com. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.